This is A Word, a podcast from Slate. I'm your host, Jason Johnson. Many Republican politicians have made attacks on Black history a part of their platform, trying to erase key perspectives and events from the nation's classrooms and libraries. But writer Michael Harriet is fighting back. This is the thing I believe. It's not black history they're whitewashing. It's white history. They don't care about us knowing what black people achieved. They care about us knowing what we had to struggle against. Black AF History, the un-whitewashed story of America, coming up on A Word with me, Jason Johnson. Stay with us. This episode is brought to you by Google. The Google Cybersecurity Certificate provides the necessary skills to begin a career in cybersecurity. Visit safety.google forward slash cyber workforce today. Welcome to A Word, a podcast about race and politics and everything else. I'm your host, Jason Johnson. It took generations for America to begin teaching facts about black history. Now, several political leaders have made it their mission to reverse that hard won progress. They're removing books about civil rights and lessons about slavery from schools, even from schools that primarily serve children of color. Even before these attacks, most Americans, even black Americans, had limited exposure to black history. The backgrounds of the people enslaved on this continent were simplified. The violence of that institution was softened. And the achievements of black people throughout this country's history were ignored. But one of the people fighting for a truer telling of black history is Michael Harriet. He's a columnist for The Griot and frequent contributor to MSNBC, whose work has appeared in The Washington Post and The Atlantic. His new book is Black AF History, The Un-Whitewashed Story of America. And he joins us now. Michael Harriet, welcome to A Word. Thanks for having me. I want to start with this. So this is the thing that most people would know of you because of your writing in The Griot, your writing in The Root, writing a bunch of different places. But history-wise, people know you because of these amazing Twitter threads you've done. And they're Twitter threads I've actually like given to my students at Morgan State University because they're short, they're punchy, they make a lot of sense. You often have citations in them. Was your Twitter the inspiration for this book? Did you just say, you know what, I should take all these viral tweets together and put them in a book? Did a publisher approach you? Like, what inspired you to write Black AF History, the unwhitewashed story of America? A lot of people don't know that I used to be a economics professor, and I'm a kind of an economist by trade. So I was going to write a book. Uh, I taught a class called Race as an Economic Construct. And I was co- going to kind of u- write a book about explaining race through economics, and not just money, but the concept of supply and demand. I finished the proposal, took it out to publishers, and every one of them came back to my agent. And was like, yeah, we like that book proposal, but what about that history stuff he does on Twitter? And so I fired off a second book proposal for this book, Black AF History. Well, you know, this was four years ago. It turned into a two-book deal. And we decided, we came to a decision because of the subtitle of the White Peopleology book. The publisher said, well, nobody's going to know what that, that arcane subject is because the title was White Peopleology Toward a More Critical Race Theory. And nobody had heard of critical race theory then. So the f- publisher said, maybe you should do the history book for, first. And then, you know, maybe you in that book, you can tell people about like this crazy thing called critical race theory. Little did I know that now everybody knows kind of what critical race theory is. So I could have had a real big bag. But, you know, at least I got a book out of it. I really enjoyed this book. And I, I've, I've said this to you. We're in chats together. I say this all the time. As a political scientist, I am sort of inherently intimidated by historians uh, because in political science, if if it's anything past 20 years, we don't really remember. So people who can actually sort of take history and put it together and make it make sense and, and have it relate are always sort of really amazing to me. You cover so much in this book. What is what is one instance of whitewash history that you think is just Maybe something that you discovered in putting the book together, like, I cannot believe that this was overlooked. I cannot believe this wasn't taught. Like, is there something that you discovered in writing this book that you were like, I got to make sure this is in there because this is so critical to to our history that we got to know it? So, yeah, there's a bunch of stuff like that. One of the main things that I think that people don't know is, one, People assume that Americans went over and white people came, went over and got us from Africa. And they just like picked up whoever 
they got. And it wasn't like that, right? So in, in this Florida example of slaves learned skills that would benefit them later, which is in that new Florida curriculum, that's a great example of it, right? So they did, slaves generally didn't learn skills here, right? In South Carolina, when the white people came, they thought they were going to be citrus farmers. Well, they sub- discovered that South Carolina soil wasn't conducive to citrus. And then they tried silkworms and then they tried a bunch of other stuff. And then there was the yellow fever. And they noticed that, wait, the, why aren't the enslaved people dying? Well, those enslaved people were growing rice. They went back to Africa to the specific places where Africans grew rice and got those people. The American style of metalwork and and ironwork and and you know blacksmithing is an African form of blacksmithing that they went specifically to Africa, to the places that had blacksmithing traditions, and got it was the biggest export of Virginia before the Civil War. So they tell us that, you know, we know we came from Africa, but it makes it seem like they just got some black folks who to do some backbreaking labor when they came for the technology, for the skill set, for the minds of the people and they know exactly where they got them from and they know exactly where their origin was and then they presented in our history books as people who didn't have a political background as people who didn't have religion it's just africans right if we're lucky right or black people right when they know they'll they'll specify oh this is a french person who came here because of you know political oppression and then the pilgrims came here because you know they wanted to worship their religion in their way and then some other people came here because of of this uh, oppression but the slaves we just picked them up and brought them here that's one of the things that i think that if people knew they would think about slavery and the creation of America different. One of the amazing parts about that, that that section in your book about rice was fascinating to me. And, and it talks about this idea that, you know, because of the incredibly diverse ecology of the continent of Africa, you had some people who made rice in fields, you had some people who made rice in pots, some people who made rice in huts. What you're saying is the enslavers like had their own version of monster.com or LinkedIn. Like they they were they were choosing the best and the brightest in order to bring over. They were not bringing over people who were just uh POWs or the dregs of society, right? What you just said, right? They weren't POWs, right? Because throughout the history of the world, People who were enslaved were generally casualties of war, were prisoners of war, were people who had been conquered. And that is the difference. You know, we talk about the race-based part, but we don't talk about the stealing part, right? Like the people enslaved in America were not even involved in wars. They were not, most of the time, they were living in peaceful places, right? It was a human stealing industry. One of the other things that, you know, look, you're noted for people of your Twitter threads. They think you're funny. They like your your writing in the grill. You're writing the root. You've you've written for late night comedy shows. You've got tons of sort of comedy writing that you've done. Where do you think your sort of comedy chops come from? Where do you think your sense of humor comes from that sort of comes out in all your writing? So I think it comes from a couple of places. One of them is the same place that the kind of the intrigue with history comes from is that I was homeschooled. And of course, I'm I, I'm in a predominantly black family <laughs> and grew up in a black neighborhood in a town that was about half black and half white. You know, I never learned to temper. I think everybody has this subconscious deference to whiteness. And I never learned that by the time I was, you know, going to school, I was 12 years old, so almost a teenager. And so I think a lot of it comes from my interest really genuine interest in how white people see things. And the other part of it is I think comedy uh, comes from like who you appreciate. And I grew up reading Twain. I'm a big fan of Chester Himes, uh, Paul Beatty. So the people I generally loved to read were funny people. And so I think it's a combination of those things. (laughs) 
We're going to take a short break. When we come back, more with Michael Harriet about his new book, Black AF History. This is A Word with Jason Johnson. Stay tuned. This is Jason Johnson, host of A Word, Slate's podcast about race and politics and everything else. I want to take a moment to welcome our new listeners. If you've discovered a word and like what you hear, please subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to podcasts. And let us know what you think by writing us at a word at slate.com. Thank you. Breaking news can be challenging to consume nowadays. And if you're constantly doom scrolling on social media, it can really take a toll. If this sounds like you, check out Up First on NPR. Up First frees you from the all-day scroll obsession by telling you everything you need to know in an easy 15 minutes. No BS, just the facts. Up First is the cure you need for news fatigue. Up First provides the top three news stories to start your day with digestible 10 to 15-minute episodes. It's all the news you need so you can get back to your life and feel informed without losing your mind in the process. With the elections in 2024, pending indictments, AI, and more, we know it's going to be chaos. Let Up First guide you through the news cycle so you can save your energy for the kids, errands, or the new season of your favorite reality show. Listen now to Up First on NPR, wherever you get your podcasts. You're listening to A Word with Jason Johnson. Today we're talking about the new book, Black AF History, with author Michael Harriet. Um, you know, we talk about like the erasure of black history, you know, generations of black folks were raised with the same whitewash stories about slavery, the civil rights movement and everything else like that. What I'm curious about is when you were putting this book together, was the idea to fill in the gaps that, you know, so many of your peers had in their education, or was it to say, look, I can't fill the spaces of how America's racist public education system has failed you. I'm trying to give you stuff that you can use in the here and now as a working adult. What was kind of your goal with the book? What I wanted to do is take a common black person's perspective of America, not black America, but America, right? We Because we see America through a different lens and in a different uh, perspective than white people, right? Um, you know, we see it for what it is a lot of times. Like when you talked about, you know, black people had their history whitewashed. Not really, though, because some of the stuff that we know, white people don't know. You know, white people's version of Martin Luther King is just limited to holding hands with little black boys and little black girl, white girls holding hands in Alabama and I have a dream speech and then he died. Right. And I think being black in America, we have, you know, at least family members or neighbors who still remember the civil rights movement. So we get a different perspective about this country. And I want I wanted to tell white people also about their history and how black people see it. Right. So in the in the part about the Revolutionary War, I don't even go into the battles and stuff like that. But the black perspective is, oh, I, these are just white folk fighting. None of those black people who were fighting were fighting for the idea of America or the idea that they wanted Great Britain to win. They were on the side which most likely affected their freedom, right? So that is a black perspective of the Revolutionary War, right? It was just some white folks fighting. Which side, the side I'm on don't have nothing to do with my belief in liberty. And Man, I'm just fighting to get free. And those kinds of perspectives, I think, are really talked about in history books or by social studies teachers. It's interesting when you talk about bringing this new perspective to these conversations and what they could mean and how we don't hear about these conversations very often. You know, you write for the Grio, but you're on cable news and you do NPR and you've had a podcast and you're in the Atlantic. One of the things that a lot of black writers, academics, scholars talk about is how they feel obligated or pressured or directly told to change or sand off the corners of their black perspective, depending on what outlet that they're in. Do you feel that pressure? Or did you maybe feel that pressure earlier in your career and now you don't? Because one of the things that I've always found impressive about you and it comes across in this book is 
It seems like Michael Harriet doesn't care. <laughs> Michael Harriet's going to tell you what he thinks. I would like to tell people that I'm brave and fearless and all that, but I just don't know how to do that, right? Like, I never learned. Like, theoretically, is there a way to make white people believe and hear what black people are saying, right? Like, you can be, you can say it nicely. They still won't accept it. They won't believe it any more than if you just scream it at them. I don't know what I could do to make myself and my voice acceptable to white people, right? Here's what I'm trying to say. If you take any demographic in America, like 99% of what everybody says is correct, right? Now, the stuff that people get wrong they are more apt to correct if somebody tells them they are wrong. Well, what demographic is least, least likely to be corrected? White people. So they get to be wrong more often. Generally speaking, they're brilliant people of all races and things, right? But those brilliant people are so few. And then you have to remember that white people ain't going to listen to the brilliant black people. So, again, I don't know what I could do to be both correct and acceptable. So I choose correct. You know, one of the things that you used to have, I don't know if you still do on some of your social media handles, some of the things you refer to yourself a lot, you call yourself a wipe apologist. But for those people who are not familiar with you or not familiar with your work, what's a wipe apologist? Like what, what, how do you define that? Because clearly you have, you have created a new area of knowledge and learning that most people aren't aware of. White peopleology is, again, I told you I was homeschooled and, you know, was around black people. I realized that to navigate this country, and I learned it at a very pretty late stage, that I was going to be, have to be intentional about learning about white people, right? And then when it comes to the larger concept, to understand race in America, to understand culture, you can't study black people, right? Black people didn't create the concept of race. They didn't create the systems that oppress. They didn't create all of the things that made black people poor, uh, you know, corralled them into certain neighborhoods, stripped, up, stripped them of their labor and their economic, uh, you know, progress. White people did that. And if you want to understand it, you have to study white people because not only did white people do it, right, they perpetuate it, and then they keep reinforcing those systems, right? So to understand, like, you can study what black people do forever, and you still won't understand America until you understand the methods and the tradition and the practices of white people, thus white peopleology. We're going to take a short break. We come back more about black history with writer Michael Harriet. This is A Word with Jason Johnson. Stay tuned. Wait, are you gaming on a Chromebook? Yep. It's got a high-res 120 hertz display, plus this killer RGB keyboard. And I can access thousands of games anytime, anywhere. Stop playing. What? Get out of here. Huh? Yeah. I want you to stop playing and get out of here so I can game on that Chromebook. Got it. Discover the ultimate cloud gaming machine, a new kind of Chromebook. You're listening to A Word with Jason Johnson. Today we're talking with columnist Michael Harriet, author of the new book, Black AF History. Um, so one of the other things that I really, really like about this book is most of your sections, whether you're talking about uh, revolutions of enslaved people, whether you're talking about modern day politics, they start with these really interesting anecdotes about your family. How did your family and growing up in this sort of mostly black environment that was invested in education, how does that infuse itself into your stories? Because I, I think that's one of the, the more compelling, and exciting parts about this book. My family greatly influenced how I see the world and who I am as a person, right? Um, so my family uh, was heavily involved in the civil rights movement. Like the reason the Supreme Court decided that protest was a form of free speech was because of a group of South Carolina students who protested at uh, the state capitol, protested segregation. My aunt and uncle twin 
brothers and sisters were the youngest people arrested at 16 years old. My uncle Isaac Williams was the longtime field secretary of the NAACP and the Jim Clyburn's original uh, chief of staff. So uh, and then on the other side of my family is like Black Panthers. So not only were they that and involved in black stuff, but I grew up in a really kind of Christian fundamentalist church. So we were always outsiders kind of anyway. And what that did is that reaffirmed and gave me comfort in, oh, you don't have to, you're not going to be like everybody else anyway, right? Like you can be a nerd because you ain't going to the Christmas party because your family don't celebrate Christmas, right? Um, right? Like you got to explain what Passover is because your family celebrates some Jewish holiday. So you ain't going to be like, you know, the cool kid. Anyway, you can forget about that. So whatever you want to be, whatever you choose to be, you might as well be yourself, right? And, and it's part of that. And then the other part is like I grew up 15 miles away from where my family on both by maternal and paternal grandparents were enslaved. So, like, we would go on the weekends. Some of them still lived on the land where they were enslaved. They eventually ended up owning some of it. So we would go there, like, almost every weekend and just, like, roam around, spend time, or just have to sit there. And it was boring then and sit there and listen to them tell all of these stories. So I think that made me a storyteller, but it also embedded me in the history of my family and like not having to kind of be someone else and assimilate into the larger world just for the sake of being cool. Right. You didn't have to go find the stories of heroism. You didn't have to go make those up. Right. You, you kind of had them within your own family. You were already, as you mentioned at the beginning, you know, you had an early book proposal that was talking about critical race theory, you know, several years before it became, you know, the buzzword for the right to sort of attack education. And obviously, uh, any school system that has an anti CRT rule would probably have serious problems with your book, especially since it's called Black AF History. Talk about what you think the long term damage of these attacks on critical race theory are doing for black children in particular. So there are a bunch of long-term damages, right? Um, first of all, what white people don't know hurts black children. What do I mean by that? So imagine if you were a 12-year-old white child and you don't know about redlining and you don't know about the legacy of slavery. You don't know about the real stuff about Jim Crow. You don't know about how this uh country created economic policies. You don't know that uh, banks could discriminate against black people and, you know, keep them from owning a bank account until 1976. Imagine you didn't know all of that, right? Didn't you grow up thinking what white people say about black people are real? They must be poor because they don't work. They must be poor because they don't focus on education. They must be poor because of their culture, because they listen to rap music. And then you grow up perpetuating those policies because for all you know, the black people are just violent and dumb and lazy. And then if you are black and you grow up learning that same history, right, without getting it supplemented by family stories or by, you know, real history, then you grow up thinking I was literally before this podcast started, I was talking to my sister and she was saying, well, you know, she was talking to this kid and he was like, well, you might as well do what the white folks say because, you know, black folks in history didn't resist slavery. They didn't resist. And she was like, wait, what? Like, they don't tell you those stories of resistance because they control the narrative. But so she started giving him a list of people. You, you ain't never heard of the Stono Rebellion. You didn't know about this. You didn't know about that. You didn't know. Right. And so it opened his eyes. But when you whitewash history, to make it seem like your people don't have a history of resistance. The other thing is that w you believe that what your situation is and you focus on that instead of dismantling the system, not knowing that you can pray as hard as you want to. You can work as hard as you want to. You still ain't going to have 
the same access to opportunity unless you dismantle that system that keeps it from you. So you ended up working yourself to death. It's it's the John Henry syndrome, right? You believe that, like, we just don't work hard enough. You believe you take on that conservative ideology because your history has been whitewashed. This is the thing I believe. It's not black history they're whitewashing. It's white history, right? They don't care about us knowing the what black people achieved. They care about us knowing what we had to struggle against. You can learn about slavery, but not how the white people treated the slaves. Not that 99.5% of the slave owners were white. You can learn about Jim Crow and integration, but not the white people spitting on your great aunts and uncles because they just wanted to go to school. You can learn about Jim Crow. You got to confine it to the South and you can't learn, you can't learn about all of the other stuff that they stole, right? Like you can't learn about your grandfather fought in, in World War II, but he didn't get GI Bill. You can't learn that all of those white people in the, those places that you call the suburbs lived there because it was built for white people with your grandparents' tax money. You can't learn that stuff, right? You can't learn that it was a government policy. And so you believe that the world is fair and just and it kind of takes away a little bit of your resistance. You know, Michael, one of the things that as, as a professor that I think about a lot is the characters in history are, are what people latch on to. Not everybody's going to remember dates and numbers. Not everybody remembers chronology, right? But people can say Al Capone, King Tut, FDR. And one of the strengths of your book, in my view, also is that like you would have these little gray sections where you talk about, okay, look, here's where you're going to learn about Nzinga. Here's where you're going to learn about Mansa Mansa, who's the, the, the richest man, you know, in, in global history. I knew about these things, but you gave them in these sort of bite-sized packets that anybody could read on the plane, in the bathroom, wherever else it is. What are say one or two great people in black history, not events, but people and black history that you think have been erased that you're like, I can't wait for people to get to this chapter because it's going to blow their mind. So one of them is, I'll give you two, like two different eras. Moses, Moses Dickinson, right? Moses Dickinson was a man who was enslaved, freed himself. And he, he worked on a steamboat cutting here, a riverboat. And so he traveled up and down the Mississippi secretly creating this group of people called the Knights of Tabor. And they had actually planned a nationwide slave revolt all across the country. Like this, it's crazy that this story is never told. Just before their date to start this nationwide slave revolt, the Civil War started. So they were like, oh, I mean, yeah, it's, it's happening now. But the interesting thing about Moses Dickinson, it's not just that, right? So the Knights of Tabor continued. They became like a kind of a Masonic group. It even had a a, a a woman's arm of the movement. And that group paid a penny a month into a fund. And that group is what built the Knights of Tabor or the Mound Bayou Hospital in Mound Bayou, Mississippi, right? It was the first black owned created hospital. And it, you look throughout like the civil rights movement and so many of those people was like, oh, you know, I was born at the Mound Bayou Hospital. Well, here's the interesting thing is the second part of that. So the chief surgeon at the Mound Bayou Hospital in Mound Bayou, Mississippi, he was a man called T.R.M. Howard. And I like to play this uh, game with myself called 12 Degrees of T.R.M. Howard. Almost any black person you've ever read about in history has some kind of connection to T.R.M. Howard. T.R.M. Howard had like an army that actually protected the black journalist who found out that like two dudes didn't kill Emmett Till. Those people stayed at T.R.M. Howard's farm and he had a black army protected them so they could investigate Emmett Till's death. T.R.M. Howard, he had an insurance company. Well, one of the first insurance agents he hired was a dude named Megger Evers, which is how he knew so much to become a part of the NAACP. When Emmett Till's mom came during the trial, she stayed at T.R.M. Howard's house. Well, T.R.M. Howard sent her up north to his friend who had left Mississippi, James Franklin, 
Aretha Franklin's daddy. And they had a fundraiser. And at the fundraiser, like a bunch of white people came, right? But they wouldn't let Aretha Franklin sing because she was pregnant. So they got a, a substitute piano player. Because you know, reach Aretha Franklin is like a piano virtuoso, a, a keyboard virtuoso. Well, this, the dude who they let play was a dude named Billy Preston. And Little Richard was there and took him on tour, which is how he met the Beatles and became known as the Fifth Beatles. Like, everything connects back to T.R.M. Howard. Like, it's almost like Ray J, like how they say everything connects to Ray J. Everything really connects to T.R.M. Howard. Wow. See, and that's, this is what I keep telling people. Like, you you really, you're, you're going to read this book and you're going to stop in several sections and you're going to Wikipedia things and you're going to look in the back because, again, these characters and these stories, they jump off the page. The humor, the wit, the engagement, all of it. I always like to end the show on a positive note or something that people can think about, people can engage in, something that they can take from this this conversation into sort of their waking lives when they're done. But I'll just ask you this. If I pick up Black AF History tomorrow and read it straight through over the weekend, right? How am I different on Monday? What's different about me? What's changed in me after I've read this book? After you read this book, you will know that history is not a thing that happened. It is a thing that is happening and you'll be able to contextualize a lot of the world that you see around you. Not about, it's not about knowing what happened in 1823. It's about what's happening in 2023. So when you finish reading this book, you won't be scared because you know, I've seen that before. That's happened before and we beat it then and we beat it now. We'll beat it again. It's really affirming in the fact that nothing on the face of the earth is new. And when you learn about the things that have happened before, when you see them again, it kind of erases that fear from you. Writer Michael Harriet is a columnist for The Grio. His new book, Black AF History, is available now. Michael Harriet, thank you so much, man. Like, I really appreciate this. Everybody definitely go out and get this book. Thanks a lot for having me, man. And that's a word for this week. The show's email is a word at slate.com. This episode was produced by Christy Taiwo Macanjula. Ben Richmond is Slate's Senior Director of Podcast Operations. Alicia Montgomery is the Vice President of Slate Audio. Our theme music was produced by Don Will. I'm Jason Johnson. Tune in next week for a word. 